Prehistoric Monuments Campar Deep in the mountain regions of the Equator, on the tributary of the Campar Canon, lies the village Aurduri. Tremendous jackpicks on all sides, isolated from the inhabited world, it is rich after a long journey over mountains entirely covered with dense forests and nearly always shrouded in thin fells of mist. But now and then, the mist is dispersed by gentle peace, massive, peak, massive peaks and jaws are revealed and between them and between them, the fellows with tender green sours and toy horses. Sunbeams play in silver streams, and the gentle murmur of waterfalls mingles in the chirping of wise birds. In this idyllic seclusion of the vast jungle, in this bit of form begotten paradise, lies our duty, and here, to our surprise, we found the remains of a mysterious sculpture columns with curves, curved capitals, beautifully chiseled and decorated with flowers. One might say in our most grease herbs, with leaf motifs, followed and human, human faces. Sometimes they stand in a row, sometimes in the neighborhood of a stone platform. Often a small column stands next to a large one, presumably the grave, the grave stones of a child and his parents. Occasionally, a flat stone lies in front of the column. Similar monuments are found in the vicinity of Suliki and Payakumbu, though less numerous. The profile is usually rectangular, the shape corners are smoothed. The curvilinear points, south or southeast, and under it sometimes appear a simple decoration. Around the base, there is occasional band of buckle. There can be no doubt that some of these columns represent human beings. The decorations differ from the usual Malay motifs, proving that these columns were made by a, pe by a people older than the Malay race. Who they were and when they lived, we do not know. About 2,000 years ago, however, South Sumatra was inhabited by a race of megalith buildings. It is therefore quite possible then the similar people live at the same time in central Sumatra, in the, in the land of Puak Datar, at the south of the Mahat, a tributary of the Kampak Kanan. We cannot thus be far wrong if we estimate the beginning of our era as the time when these monuments were built. Their founders were also presumably the makers of the monolithic tools found in several places along the Kampak Kanan. Sibirwang, Muara Mahat, and Kuok. These tools show a remarkable resemblance to those used for a similar purpose in the Malay Peninsula, and we will therefore turn our attention first to this region. Now, we find also in Malacca men here having a curved vineyard in conspicuous likeness to the columns of Puak Datar, the only difference being that. The former are rough and unfinished, while the latter are carefully finished and decorated. The former may be compared with the rows of stone in South Sumatra, although the latter are generally smaller and rounder. The great rough stone, of, rough stone fragments of Malacca really bear the greater similarity to the, to the monuments of South East Nias Tetegewo to, her, to Higewo. At Pankal, Camp, at Pankal Campus in Negri Simbilan stand a few columns of which one, strangely enough, is called Pedang, Sword or Chris. Like the pillars of Sumatra, they are adorned with folds, laws also with conventional figures of animals, such as a bird, a horse, and a dragon. Certainly, it is not a sudden that a pillar of Guguk at Guguk, Puak Datak, also has the conventional figure of an animal bearing a stone bearing a strong resemblance to a face with a bird's head.
Now, it is well known that the people of Malacca and Negri Sembilan originally came from Menangkabau, and it is certainly not by chance that in this latter country we also find large unfinished fragments of stone. Naturally, we can we cannot determine whether these monuments originated in Malay Peninsula or in Sumatra, but there can be no doubt as to their relation. When we seek to explain the, the meaning, however, we encounter serious difficulties. The present inhabitants of these regions give an account of them. It is true, but it is extremely doubtful if the assertions have any value. How often does it not happen that ancient monuments are surrounded by legends which have no relation to their original purpose? Only when these accounts agree with observations on living megalith cults, they have value. The inhabitants of Wagdatar say that these columns are partly grave monuments to their ancestors, partly memorials to the founding of a federation Tandanegri, and partly the boundary of assembling places where four games were formerly played. The sieves sat on the flat stones and laid against the pillars. Formerly, these monuments stood near the council hall valley. Near the pillars, buried gold is sometimes found, and at their dedication, there was a sacrifice of cockboss. This information tallies so exactly with our observations in years that there can be no doubt as to its accuracy. Probably, the pillars also have some relation to the Feast of Merit. It is even possible that the form may have some historic and religious connection with many Malay and Japanese Christ handles. Originally, the form of the Christ haft must also have indicated the owner's rank. In both instances, an attempt have, has been made to portray the founder of the life. At the same time, one must not lose sight of the fact that men hills with curved summits are also found in other parts of the archipelago, i.e. in Nias and Flores. There was on the border of Burma and Yunnan, erect rows and of great wooden pillars, the tops of which are often curved. Every pillar is a hollow in which is kept a several human head to encourage the growth of, of the corpse. In poor data, main hills are always moved near mosques and council houses, proving that the people are still conscious of the relation between house and monument. In Pasema, we find a relation between main hills and spirit houses, Rumah Poyang. In Arduri, there is a terrace one meter high and measuring five times five meter, apparently an ancient place of worship. The present inhabitants, however, assert that it was formerly the meeting place of four mighty, mighty ships, Tanem Batu Mini, Tanem Batu Nini Berampe, i.e., the Datus Raja di Bale of Muratakui, the Bendahara of Mahe, the Munkal of Siri, and the Ketalowe of Mojo Indo. The prehistoric monuments of central Sumatra have always been held in some reference, and there has ever been has even been an attempt to adapt them to the new religions. For instance, at Guruk Payakumbu stands a beautifully sculpted pillar, 4.50 meter high, with a Hindu summit. King Aditya Varman, 14th century, often made use of sacred prehistoric pillars for his inscriptions. At Kumbu Raja are three leaning stones, Sandaran, and sundry stones but Batu Panchak Matahari were formerly the Raja held council with his party and Tumengung while all faced to the south. In front of the central stone lies a flat slab. In Menangkabau, the Raja Nantigo Silo or Lords of the Three Stone States are very well known. The Batu Palimawan is also when, is also known. The stone on which the Raja Ibadat is purified with Lemon Balimau before attaining his new dignity and addition. There are several crude images and rice blocks with, with inscriptions. 
on on the grave on the grace of Raja Alam at Gudam are even found two pillars with beautiful decorative decorative Mohammedan motifs on a grave of Paragayum we found a monolith with a faint resemblance to a human form wearing a girdle and two creases at Guguk Pariakumbu also stands a stone ball said to have been used for drinking water for fighting cocks. Finally, attention must be called to something very remarkable. At Sintuo in Menangkabau is found a stone terrace with several seats. On the west side is an altar of rough stones on which lies a stone broken in two and therefore called Batu Bertikam. The legend relates that the famous lawgiver Pepati Sebatang fixed the stone with his kiss during a quarrel with his, with his equally famous adversary, Kiai Katumengungan. This certainly has modern interpretation, and it may be assumed that the place was sacred long before the birth of these two lawgivers. Three stones are worshipped in many parts of the archipelago as a symbol of femininity. A curious instance of, a curious instance of this is found in the Malay archipelago a remarkable square, a remarkable square pillar in Pangkalan Kempas has for inscription, has for inscriptions, to in clear cut Arabic from 14, 6, 14, 16, 7, or 8, 14, 68, and two inventor letters in Old Javanese. Before, before, below these inscriptions, a circular hole is cast through the below and just large enough to allow the passage of a man's arm. A second pig stone lies on a hill near the town of Malacca. Korinchi The people who live southeast of Lake Korinchi were formerly headhunters. It is said that more it is said that more tiger people live here than in any other part of Sumatra. They build remarkable houses with beautiful wood carvings in the attic. In the attic are often kept miniature houses adorned with color carat cotton. In these little houses lie many old relics pusakas as inscribed buffalo horns, tree bucks, tree bark, tree bark and bamboo, articles of clothing, weapons, guns, stones, etc. They, are be, they belong to the six wives who come at certain times to burn incense and still rise before them. Their ceremonies are accompanied by the sing of sacred songs in a strange language. The people hold these pusakas is great honor. They offer sacrifices and take oaths before them. The pusakas may only be touched by women and are brought down in important occasions such as wars, such as war epidemics, the reception of illustrious guests, the installation of ships, etc. The cow is slaughtered, then the sacred relics are carried around the village while the people sing and rejoice, burn incense, scatter burn guys, suit of guards, and beat on gongs and drums. On this occasion slaves, called the young the young, perform a dance. The Dayang Dayang are the property of the Pusakas. For Berli, there were public women who, while dancing, made themselves tipsy by drinking great quantities of palm wine. Some of them became possessed by spirits and other confused rites, which were supposed to be a message from the gods. In addition to women slaves, the Pusakas also have men slaves called Buddha, Buddha Anda and even special fields sawah rapat of which harvest belong to the chiefs. It appears that formerly the Dayang Dayang and the Buddha Anda were, inter- were entrusted with the care of Pusakas. The chief gave them a part of his income, but they had to collect it, it, they collect it themselves. They are from a special case and were held in bad repute. Now this condition has ceased to exist. At several places southeast of the Lake Canon Sep, st- st- on the Lake Canon Sep stones are found. 
at Lumpung Mudik lies a specimen 3.25 meter long and pointing north. The rare surface has a diameter of 1 meter and has in the center of first hump, surrounded by five shallow concentric groups at a nothing with low reach. It is said that this cannon was fired at the Gunung Korinchi, the highest mountain in Sumatra, and that on this occasion part of the summit of Gunung Pepat flew off. A little further at Lulu Kecil lies a second specimen, which is 4 meter long, undecorated and pointing short. The largest stone on is the largest stone is at Muak, is 4.50 meter long and points to the northwest. A fort is said to lie on the north slope of Gunung Risi. It is octagonal and points to the Gunung Mesurai. The, the first question which arises concerning these mysterious stones is how old are they? It may be conjectured that they are imitations of ordinary cannon and so were made at the most about four centuries ago. It is, however, not plain the what purpose was served by these imitations. They were useless for war and for religious purposes. Real cannon, real cannon could better have been used. Now in Jambi, farther east, farther east, and far are found stones beating a remarkable resemblance to the above, and most certainly made during the Neolithic age. Moreover. At Junjun, on the south shore of Lake Korinchi, were found a bronze calf, the fragment of kettle drum, a bronze face, and decorated fragments from the Neolithic age. It is therefore seem likely, though the statement cannot be proved, that the cannon also dead from this period. Apparently, there are memorials to these three ships and lie in the vicinity of graves. They were cut into phallic into fairly form to endow the people and their fields with increased fertility. Certainly women former certainly certainly women formerly made votive offerings to the stones and prayed for the blessing of, of children just as they still do near real canon. To this day in Corinthi red stone stairways are built leading to the fields on the hills exactly as in Nias. Jambi, southeast of Korinchi, in the district Poatin Pua, Tuo Jambi, lie 12 cannon shaped stones which are from 3 to 4 meter long and flattened on the underside. The narrow fork, the narrow fork parts points to the east. The rear part is flat and decorated. The largest stone lies at Tanjung Puti. It is broken in two and protects a primitive coaching figure with upraised arms. In the right hand, he holds a sword bent over his head. In the left, in the left hand, on an inter inter indeterminate object, a dozen to a less a stone with the figure of human head. At Gedang, at at Gedang, a stone of with a woman head mutilated and a man. In most of these stones, the upper surface and the sides are ornamented. The specimen at Dusun Tua has a mender on the upper surface and five gongs on each side. This last monument justifies the theory that these monuments must have been built by people who were in contact with the land where the mender was indigenous with and without a doubt this must be have been China. The sculptures thus probably become, came from Tonkin when so many people migrated to the Indonesian archipelago, perhaps they were in Jambi already at the beginning of our era, in which, in which case we have here the earliest records on certain gods. It is reasonable to suppose that these pindars are monuments to the dead. In the, in the mid immediate vicinity were found red, blue and yellow birds, also bits of gold and a bronze spear coin. The custom of hanging gongs on the tombstone is found among the Dayaks, while in Toba we saw a sarcophagus in which, gong li in which gongs lie. North of this region, on the farther bank of Merangin, in Tanahrena, grottoes have been found 
showing traces of a Neolithic flake called Ulu Ta Ulu Chanko, a stream on the Batang Hari where found Chinese ceramics from the Han period, i.e. red porous earthen wire with a great with a green glaze. This indicates the chi the Chinese were buried here at about the beginning of our era and is the oldest evidence we have of the relation between China between China and Jambi. Pasema Concerning of the origin of the inhabitants of Pasema Besema, the following legend is taught. During the Golden Age of the Javanese Kingdom Majapahit, 14th century, a, bro a brother and a sister, Atong Bungsu and Puti Sedang Biduk, came with a, number, with a number of followers from Java. The sister settled at Palembang, where she soon became a mighty princess. Her brother went into the interior and arrived at a place where the Pasema River flows into, Lema, into the Lematang. Here, the water was swarming with Besema fish, and therefore Atong Bungsu settled here and founded Benua, Ki, Benua Kling. He had four sons, who became the founders of four families. The most remarkable of the son, of the sons was Sarunting Sakti. According to another legend, Sarunting was the son of the giant Poyang, Poyang Panjang, who needed nine servants to support his genital organs, and so-called Sembilan Gelas, nine basket lots. Some say that Sarunting himself needed the carriers, the carriers that he was born on the of the sun. Poyang Panjang was married to the princess Tenggang, a daughter from the Ratu Dai Gunung Ratu Dai Gunung Ledang, na near Pagaguyung. No children were born to them. However, so one fine day they went to Padang Langar to dance and pray to act as if they were rocking a child. Suddenly a child ran to meet them and they called Bihim Serunting. He grew up, became Sakti a magician, and married a beautiful girl with a brother named Ria Tibing. The brothers in law planted their fields side by side in the forest, separately only by a felt tree trunk. The back, the back facing the field of the Ria of Ria Ria Tibing, turned into gold, into gold where Sagunting side grew nothing but those stores. Sometimes at night, Sagunting turned the trunk around. But in vain, the god was always for his brother-in-law and the thoughts tolls for him. This spoiled their friendship. Hard words were spoken. They even came to blows. But since both, mag but since both, but since both were magicians with equal power, neither was victorious. Kriyatibing, however, noticed that when he got to his brother-in-law during the flight, the latter's voice came from different directions, and so he persuaded his sister to cause the secret from her husband. Next day, she told her brother that Serunting had the power of hiding his soul in a long, a long leaf, and that he could only be wounded by pitching the along, along by the along by pitching the along with the stem of a bamban leaf. Immediately, Ria Tebing resumed his flight, picked a trembling along along and second thing fell with a terrible wound in his leg. From the broken reed flowed a drop of blood, part of which was born crippled tiger. His descendants live on the Dembu volcano and are hostile to all people except to the descendants of Serunting. Serunting was, to, was so depressed by this treachery that he decided to seek death by drowning himself in the sea. He baked a great pot of, a, of clay and this floated down the river. The pot landed near Mount Seguntang, where lived an old man from Mojopahit. He spent to the mouth of Serunting, thus endowing, his, thus endowing him with the magic power of changing people into stone by a mere wood. Henceforth, he was caught see by leader Peter Tang because his saliva was fatal. Second thing, now returned to his village, where he found that his wife had died 
of remorse. Ria Tebing fled west with his followers to the west of Bukit Barisan, near the broken mountains Gunung Patah. Their spirits live to this day in the form of little green birds hostile to the descendants of seventeen. For years, the latter, for years, the latter lived with the wife until one day he saw, he saw his reflection in a well and suddenly felt lonesome. Soon after, seven nymphs hung their veils on the branches of a tree and began to dance by the well. Seventeen succeeded in seizing one of these veils and so obtained the nymph Sangul Bagulang as his wife. She bore him a son who became the founder of the Simirang tribe. On this occasion, Seventeen suddenly remembered that he had not yet given a wedding feast and decided to do so at once. From far and near the people streamed to attend the cockfights among the guests where the youths who came to ask to a tragic end. Before returning home, they asked Sangul Bagulang if she would dance for them. The nymph now asked Serunti for her help and began to dance. They were say and began to dance. To Serunti, it seemed that her feet did not touch the ground and fearing that he might lose her, he might lose her, he cried, she is vanishing. At his words, the nymph began to weep and lament, for now she was compelled to disappear in reality. Her husband was inconsolable, and his worry he cursed the three youths, the three youths and changed them into stone. Filled with thoughts of vengeance, he now wandered all the all over the country, damming the rivers and flooding the fields. But his end was approaching. At the outlet of the Combering, it was observed that the river was running the dry, was running dry. Now there was a giant named Matempat, who had no magic power but two extra eyes hidden under the hair at the back of his head. He journeyed to the south of the Combering, found something near Lake Ranau, under the great sugar palm and now Rishi of another bow, and challenged him to fight. One of them had to lie fast down under the tree. While the other heard a speck of him, a speck at him, Serunting climbed into the tree and held his spear at Matempat. The latter, however, saw the spear with the eyes at the back of his head and managed to avoid it. But when Serunting's turn came, he was vitally wounded. Matempat climbed down from the tree and was curious to find out if the tongue of his famous adversary actually was bitter. He knelt down by the corpse, opened the mouth and carefully licked at the tongue. At the same moment, he was turned into stone. The petrified bodies were later defied by the people. Every man took a piece and laid it in his field or in his village to assure a rich harvest and many children. A grandson of seventeen, named Sangha Gujungan, one day was changed into a tiger and devoured his daughter, his own daughter. Often he appeared in the villages when the feast was being celebrated, but harmed no one by your first Sangha, a sacrifice of rice and four eggs. The people could always summon him and ask his, deep, and ask his advice. The village of Serunti Sakti Sipai Lida had something tragic something which touches the heart of every Malay. This young man with his strong noble and character seemed destined for a life of happiness and good fortune. The gods, however, as the kid otherwise, they gave him a Trachus, Trachus wife and aroused him and aroused his righteous dignation by the tree of by the tree with gold and thought stalls. A fight with his brother in law and humiliating defeat were the result. The broad heart of the Malay was so humiliated that he no, he no longer wished to live, to live but so that this favor was not granted to him. He was compelled to live, endowed with supernatural power. But with this power, he also got a feeling of intense loneliness. loneliness. He made a second marriage. And this too ended in tragedy. 
with a heart full of bitterness, bitter tongue wandered to the pleasant of pleasant left wound of Sumatra, near the lovely blue lake Ghana, that at that at last freed him from his somber existence. Between second thing and seizing among a raja, the mysterious royal battle priest, there are several remarkable points of similarity. Neither was the two ruler, ruler, but both exercise, but both, but both exercise more than regal power over their countrymen. Both were endowed with the, with magic power. They curse both dead to all adversaries. Second thing, could, could cover back mountains with vendor, singang mangaraja could make rain, but both were able to grant the blessing of children. Both control the secret laws of nature. Naturally, there are differences between the two, simply physio, physi, physi, psychological. Singamang singa Raja personifies the heart, merciless batak, second thing the emotional, tender hearted Malay. It is interesting to note that the people of Fasima also have a form of shamanism one expression of which is known as Tilol. As a rule, this takes place in the case of sickness, or when someone has been accused by the spirits, a Tilol sense usually begins about 8 o'clock in the evening and often lasts until dawn. On this occasion, use on this occasion, use is on this occasion, use is made of the village square, which is covered with mats. On the mats must be placed the following objects: two pieces with of white cotton cloth, a sword, a short sword, a small basket petra tarinjawi, in which are a circle of linen cloth, cloth, a loop of white thread, to which is tied a silver ring of ni or a needle, a white cup filled with rice and incense burner, water in a white cup, a saucer of rice of rice porridge, and steam gluten rice. And a plate with the following contents a pile of siri leaves on which is laid the leaf of gambe on top sends a miniature rice block with three hollows the central hollow contain water the, or the other two of rice powder and a bit of cotton on the other side of the block is spread a twig of celas and chandani on the other stored cigarette the plate also contains five bits of pinang, a gambig leaf pasted with siri and a leaf of siri folded into shape of a paper pot. From a, from, for a sense of tilol, from a sense of tilol, two people are required, the medium I am tilol and his leader Dukun tilol. Only men are allowed to act as mediums and the only requirement is that they soon become unconscious. As a rule, every village has someone available who has already served in this capacity. At the beginning of sense, the medium must be entirely covered, especially his eyes, nose and ears. Also in sense is spoon. Before beginning his journey to the spirit the, to the spirit world, however, he is struck on the forehead with a tree of celacy, while the Dukun says that he must now be on his way. On the I am Tilol begins his journey, and in muffled tones, he tells you of his experiment, experiences. Generally, he first meets some wild animal, after which he chases moving about. As soon as the Dukun observes this, he uses the medium not to be afraid, but to go on. Sometimes, the medium stops, before a bridge which is being built, so that there is no connection between the two banks of a river, and it is amusing to see how he makes a leap from the ground as if he were indeed taking a jump. Further on, he encounters an iron pot full of a red hot liquid, then a huge caterpillar and the spirits of those who have met an unnatural death, as for instance in childbirth. At every encounter, the same thing is observed. The medium is afraid and hesitates for a moment, while the Dukun tells him 
to have no fear and ask him to go on. At length he arrives in the land, in the land where the spirit abides, and now he can begin to ask the counsel. Often it is Poyang Ketunggalan, also called Puyang, pa Puyang Pagar, to whom they turn for information. The Poyang takes position of the medium and speaks through his mood. He calls the name of one of the bystanders who replies, The I am has come to you, O Puyang, beseeching you to return a disaster which has been visited upon us. Tell us what evil we have done. Usually, this entreaty must be repeated several times before the poor young replies. The evil deed is usually murder, perjury, or adultery. Those present, uh, those present are now in high, in a high state of tension, especially the sick man's relatives, being seized with fright. It is very rare, therefore, for the charge to be denied. Now. This, they must give the Poyang a sacrificial meal, confess the guilt, and beg his forgiveness. The Ayam Tilol is given a copious meal, two pieces of cotton cloth, and ten rice cakes. The Dukun also is invited to a feast and given a present of money. Another, another for the Samanism is Mutos Gentong. In which, however, no dukun is necessary, while women also may act as medium. Those who are adapted for this for this role are regarded as belonging to a higher order than the ayam tilol. Here too, the medium must take a journey to the spirit world, thereby losing her own name and being given the name of a soul. A third form of shamanism is tenong, a form of augury. According to where the use is made of rice grinds, a pickaxe, a fish, a fish trap, etc., it is known as the long body, the long billion, etc. The duke invokes various gods until suddenly the grains of rice begins begin to move, which is a sign that one has reached the god who who has caused the sickness, the dugun asks what crime the sick man has committed and what remedies he must use. Now he names all the various medicines until the grain again begins to move. The Peru button occupies a prominent place in the folklore of Pasema. It is a set of woven bamboo, the fraud of which is ornamented with small bits and cells. It hangs on the band worn with cloth while on the other side all sorts of strange things are fastened to dried pots, locks of goat hair and goat's horns, bits of fish jaws, hells, etc. The Perubatan is an abiding place for the soul and is met whenever a woman expects a child. As soon as the child is born and has been washed, the Perubatan is held before it and this was spoken. I call you O soul and beseech you for a long life. The idea being that the child's soul is united with the Pagubatan. The seal is now kept as the back of the house and produced again when the child's navel string has severed and he is brought down to the down to the is brought down to the river for the first time. As a rule, this ceremony is performed by some women chosen for her skill in reciting magic formulas. She takes, she takes the child in her arms and hangs the Peru button over her shoulder. At the moment that she descends from the house and sets foot on the ground, she prays for the child. Arrived at the river bank, she repeats her formulas, begging that the child may have a long life and that he may be spared for all misfortune, the water is conceived as the boat of good and evil spirits, the Perubatan serving as protection for the latter. The child is brought from the first time to the village of his mother's family. The Perubatan is again worn over the shoulder. 
it is also used if a child happens to eat his own excreta. This is considered an evil omen, which may even result in the soul leaving the body. And, and now, a strange ceremony is used in order to recall the soul. The child is placed in one of the village houses, while the mother with the purple button over her shoulder knocks at the door of various houses, asking if anyone has seen her child. After she has knocked at six houses, she approaches the seventh, where she has previously left her child and repeats the question, which is then answered in the affirmative. Now she enters the house and while she walks seven times around her child, she says, I call you back, O soul, throw away all that is all that is full and unclean, and when you are purified, return to me in this way if it is affected. Finally, the Peru button is used when the child had, ha, has had some accident which has not terminated fatally. The child, however, has been so frightened that the soul has left the body. Now, it is recalled with the aid of the Peru button. If a child falls so hard that he cannot utter a sound, it may be not pick, at, pick up at once, but only after someone has walked around it seven times with a Peru button. If the Peru button is lost, for instance, when a house burns down, it is believed that the child is doomed to become, to become ill. In all haste, a new Peru button must be made to which the soul may be fastened. When the child is five years old, the seed is no longer considered necessary as the soul is then sufficiently united with the body. One Peru button may be used for several children so that it is not necessary to make a spirit shield for each child. The Petra Hatin Jawi is a small basket in which are found a skin of white wheat, a cup of rice and a silver object. The meaning of these things is as follows. The cup of rice, which has been cleansed from all impurities, it is the symbol of a pure conscience, the skin of thread serves to tie the soul, where the silver object indicates that one has a white heart, a calm mind. The silver is usually a ring of a co or a coin. The Petra Talijawi is the assembling place of all the souls in the family so that they may not fly away. It is carefully put away in the house and must be present at every sacrificial feast. Then the soul basket is placed at the head of the mat on which the various dishes were accept. A sacrificial male is supposed to place it the gods and the ancestral spirits who, though invisible, always take part in the feast. The object of setting out the Petra Kalijawi is to command the souls of those present to the good spirits and, and, as, and as a symbol of pure humility. In Pasema's small box is the most dread of all diseases, and when there is an epidemic in this sickness, it is said that heaven and earth have been disturbed. In order to prevent other villages from being infected, the people assembly by night in the spirit house bearing the Petra Talinjawi. Beside, besides the treat, the cup and the ring, there is also a string of cells, the number of cells indicating the number of souls in each house. The baskets are then entrusted to the guardian of the spirit house where they are kept for seven days and seven nights. The guardian himself lies down to sleep in hope that the gods may send him a dream, revealing how the collected souls of his fellow villagers may be protected from the dread disease. For the descendants of Semidang, one of the six tribes of Spasema Lebar, these ceremonials must be represented every year, immediately after the harvest. Apparently, it is hoped that this will have a populating effect. On this occasion, on this occasion, the baskets are kept only for three days and three nights in the room of Poyang. The, to bind a soul, an iron object may be also used 
preferably a knife of some particular make. This is done only after a, re after a revelation. To make holes in the field house, in, in the field use, is made of a stick, the point of which is carved in the form of a penis. From the natives of Fasema believe that the rice has a soul and is a woman. Nawal is a secret magic, the object of which is to bring the soul of the rice, of the rice from the neighbor's field to have one's home, one's own, so that the harvest may increase. When the harvest is the most ripe, a fire is made in, in, the, in the immediate vicinity of the field which is to be blighted. Into the fire is thrown all kind of filth, so so that the stench may frighten the, the rice hole and cause it to flee. The next day is the field again. The next day, the field again visited on the tree then Tunggal Panu Tunggul Panjulung. Tunggal penjulung and are, are laid an egg and some rice porridge in order to place it the seven river gods. Meanwhile, complaining and begging them to increase the rice harvest. After these seven rice stems are cut off and the owner of the field is supposed to give some trifle, for instance, a, a, straw, of cig a straw cigarette. In the meantime, an assistant remains in the field, going through the motions of winnowing the rice and heaping it into a basket. In a secluded corner is placed a cake, a cage, in which it is hoped that a bird might be caught. This bird is related to the rice soul, and when it has been caught, is it is brought. It is brought to the owner's feet and given the best of care. When all this has been done, the soul of the field will be good to the owner in serving a, a rich harvest. Prehistoric monuments The native of Pasema came originally from Pasema Lebar, a plateau in the Barisan Mountains with an average hike from with an average hike of from 500 to 1,000 meters to the north, it is bounded by Gumai Mountains to the west of the Empo Volcano to the south by Gunung Pata, while on the east there is no defined, definite boundary. From Pasema Lebar, these people migrated during the course of ages simply because of the scarcity of good fits suitable for agriculture. The oldest migration was probably to Semendo a plateau southeast of Pasima and began from the village of Perdip, Perdipe on the, on the right shore of the Lematang. The inhabitants of this village were from early times followers of Islam, a fact mentioned by Press in 1818. They read the Quran, two ritual baths, observed the Puasa, etc. They had a leader of their own. Who bore, this title, who bore the title of Nabi Penghulu concerning this tribe, named Semendo. Tradition relates that their adat is of Javanese origin. The religious teacher, Santri, from Mataram, first revealed these precepts to their forefathers when they were still a wild tribe wandering about in the forest at Kebanagung, near Pagar Al Pagaralam. There's still an old Mohammedan grave. When a Navi Penghuli lies buried, perhaps this very santri, at any rate, Fergus figures is re in relief, where a typical Javanese Chris. In Pasema and Enfurons, we find a great number of prehistoric megaliths, upright stones, to the two rest blocks, dolmens, chests images and terraces. The bright stones are in groups of four as well as in rows. A tingi hari is an interesting pillar with the relief of a man and a crocodile reminiscent of the pillars which the Dayaks erect for their dead hampatong. The tools are used partly to hold skulls, partly for holy water and gear. This water affected the influence of burnt magic 
and was used for ablutions during the marriage ceremony, after funerals, in times of war, etc. The rice blocks sometimes have six hollows. This dumbbell is in connection with the rank and standing of the owner, as in the Batak lands. One of them is adorned with a serpent. The chests are painted inside with pictures of men and buffaloes, apparently portraying the soul on its journey to the underworld. There are also pictures of monkeys with their fingers on each head, religious mutilations. Professor Heiner Gelden has, has compared the, these, these paintings with Chinese grave frescoes from the Han period. The colors used are yellow, red, and brown. This peculiar combination reminds one of the Lampong cloths on which ships are portrayed are also of certain seeds in Borneo. Undoubtedly, these colors and motifs has, have come down from a very ancient art of painting which have existed at one time in large parts of Southeast Asia. The stone terraces are a reminiscence of the earthen terrace pyramid of Toba, still built above the graves of illustrious Batak chiefs. The images naturally surpass all the other monuments in interest. In the main, in the, in the main they represent human beings on the elephants of Karbos, but there are also other figures. Often, the image of men wear a short tunic, helmet, chain, and sword. We will not attempt to describe them all, but we linger only with a few. A few kilometers north of Pagaralam was one of was one a magnificent stone in the form of an elephant. The, at the left side of the animal kneels a warrior with a pointed helmet on his head. With both hands, he clings to the elephant's ear and looks back. Around his neck is a bronze ring in his girdle a girl's sword, and on his back a bronze drum. His legs are encased in bronze rings, predecessors of our modern putties. On the other side appears a warrior with the same equipment. He was a twofold girdle from which in front and behind hangs a slip of clothes. Around the right waist is a broad band compared to a bronze calf of Ju Jun Korinchi. The, the man has just arisen and is, play, and is placing his right foot on the bent foot of the eleven. In a moment, or the, in a moment, the animal will rush his foot and set man on his back. An exploration of this place in 1936 brought to light a number of great stones. Ten meters west of Batu Gaja, where stones are arranged in a square. There can be no doubt that this is a cemetery. It lies in the immediate vicinity of a place where a small lake flows into a tiny stream. Probably, the churchyard was made here for a special reason and the lake formerly had some religious significance. In fact, most of the antiquities of Pasema lies along the rivers. The Batu Gaja was evidently erected by two ships, whose particular merits gave them the right to have themselves immortalized with an element. It served as the grave monument the soul stone in which the spirits might find a last resting place after death. Possibly, they had the stone made during their lifetime. Something similar is found among the Sidayaks of Borneo, where occasionally the feast of elephants, Kawai Gaja, is celebrated. The feast may only be given by a warrior who has been especially lucky and well and has suffered a great number of heads. A, a long pole is erected with a wooden elephant at the top, and near this pole a sacrifice is made. Similar images are found among the Kenya Dayaks. The elephant is found on the remarkable wavings with ships, which are made in this district, as well as in Koe and, Lamp, and, and, the, Lamp, and the Lampongs, and in, in elephant. From a, in, Urns in elephant form are found in the eastern part of the Batak lands in Malungun, also images of warriors of ele on elephants. The elephant, as a grave monument in primitive form, 
made of cloth and filled with straw, is also found among the lotus naga of Assam. In a more perfected form, they are found in China, for instance, on the avenue leading to the Ming graves, which is flanked by pairs of elephants. This motif occurs already in the Song and Tang periods, and traits of elephants have ever been found in Chang graves, i.e. at much earlier period than the images of Pasema. The eleven images of South Sumatra thus have no relation to the Hindus, to, as, as has often been asserted, but were inspired by Far Indian and Chinese models. A striking proof of this is found on, in our Batu Gaja itself. On the back is chiseled the head of a fabulous animal with tusks and similar heads are found already in the older Chinese art. The elephant also appears on the previous prehistoric bronze drums of Bima and Selier. Selier. Let us now consider the three detailed images at Pagar Alam Marga Pagar Gunung. It is a group presenting two tigers in the act of mating. Between the paws of tigers stands a human figure. On the shield of Palak Kunduran, where the Ayer Mulak flows into the Lematang, lie the fragments of a huge image group representing a tiger which has sprung upon a buffalo in such a way that the hind, that the hind feet have a strangle grip on the victim's head. The great tiger, the great tiger head was broken to piece into two pieces, which were found buried in two different places. Some portions are so pulverized that reconstruction is impossible. What is the meaning of these mysterious images? In order to answer this question, we must remember the attendant tiger, the belief in which is prevalent throughout Sumatra. Many people are supposed to have an animal of this kind, whose woe and well are inevitably wound up with those of his master. In many Malay villages, one hears stories of people who make friends with tigers, ride to the forest of the animal's back, and learn that the art of fencing from them. Often this friendship takes the form of certain degree of relationship but the one being identified with the other. Here the tiger is considered as a sort of double and the fate of the two is closely intertwined. Analogies called this phenomenon Natu Nagualism. The Bada tribe Maga Baliat is not allowed to eat tiger meat. Is not allowed to eat tiger meat, and the Menangkaba tribe Luhak Agam declares that they all descend, descend from the tiger. The image a Palakudura, Palakunduran may have been erected by some prominent person as tribute to his attendant tiger to glorify the mark and power of this animal double. No doubt it was purposely set up at a conjunction of two rivers because such places are believed to have an evil magic. After the founder's death, he soul found a resting, a resting place in this image and was united forever with the great attendant tiger. The creation of an image of this kind was probably only, only granted to those who had first given a tiger face as in years, or who had won the name of tiger by their powers in head hunting. This title is still held in great honor among some Malay and Batak tribes. Hairy people can go without fear to the village of Talang Pisang on the Dempo Volcano, where only tigers live. It is only, it is not, so, it is not so very long ago that the pro, that prominent chiefs in Koi had a wooden tiger image flesh in the gravel of their horse. A remarkable parallel is seen in the hampatongs of soul pillars of Borneo, carved with all sorts of human and animal figures and usually erected after the last death feast. A special group is formed by the tiger images which carry a human being on their back or sit on men's head. Sometimes tiger images were made from, for a rajah's funeral and the animal was supposed to accompany the dead in the next world, sometimes 
these images were set up in the death in the death house now the tiger is not found in borneo by harimau the dayak means the machan the heart of wildcat the tiger poles are therefore not inspired by an indigenous culture but must but must at some time have been brought for another country but from which country this we may learn from the pillars which saw a tiger fighting with a serpent this motif is also found in china once it proceed which once it proceeded to siberia in the form of wolf and serpent the image uh, the image at tiger alam with a human figure between the poles reminds one of the a similar bronze image from the china Chow period also of two wooden figures from borneo one on a dead house at Lakum, on the lower Mahakam, we be seen a tiger with an olive village chief in his jaws. The other at Kasungan, in the southeast division, portrays a tiger head with its forefather at, on a human head. The motif of an animal monster holding a human being in the spouse is also found in Siberia and Northwest America to temples. As to the original idea, new research must be made in each particular case. It is usually impossible to find the exact solution to the problem because the original significance has long been forgotten. The old devouring demon of initiation, the destructive warning moon and the primeval man probably form the foundation of this motif. In the image of Pager Alam, however, we are reminded most of a human being and his attendant tiger. The image at Palakunduran turns our, turns our guests on several bronze objects from Ordos, North China, and Luristan, Persia, on which are portrayed deer and horses being attacked by tiger. However, great may be, however great may be the distance which separates these images, still a certain relation is apparent. An image from Tebing Tinggi Pasema also bears some relation to Ordos. It represents three wrestlers and probably has reference to a ritual contest, the purpose of which was to increase the validity of the face of the Sif's magic, Sif's magic power. At the sacrificial face of the Bath Ancestor, a bull, a bull is sacrificed after which there is a wasting match between the butcher and the leader of the feast. In the Nicobaran, the men were in front of the village spirit pool, while among the lesser in British India where the important megalith cult, wasting matches takes take place during certain religious ceremonies. The Lucis of British India believe that the kingdom of the dead is guarded by a man who suits at the souls of the departed. However, he spares those who do he spares those who during the lifetime have killed some animal, for instance a tiger. These tiger souls follow the hunter in the half after and sometimes he rides on them. Finally, there is a custom of the Lota Nag Lota Nagas Assam of placing bamboo tigers of placing bamboo tigers and the graves. Very interesting also is a stone with reliefs at Ayer Puar. Two men with pointed helmets, each hold, each hold a, 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 a buffalo by a rope, while together they hold a drum. Under the drum appears a dog, a crocodile bites him in the leg. It is difficult to give an explanation of this representation. In font, in voluntarily, one thinks of the story of how shamanism originated among the Kubus. A dead dog was made alive by beating drums, saying prayers, and slaughtering buffaloes. But it is also possible that the great ships are simply portrayed with their heraldic symbols of wild buffaloes and dignity drum and with their heraldic animals. The drum is an attribute which stands in close relation to the rank of the tribal ship. Various information seems to indicate that a man had the right to place a drum in his buffalo, in his house, only after the sacrifice of a slave or certain animal buffalo 
dog, rabbit, or after the certain feast has been celebrated. The spirit of the victim then lived in the drum and when it was struck, his voice was heard. No doubt the figures of men and animals pictured on prehistoric and, and, and bronze and modern bronze drums bear some relation to this phenomenon. For instance, in Dongson Tonkin has been found a drum with a figure of a dog. In Salt Nias, it is related that formerly once a year a drum feast was celebrated during which the village during which the villagers sang and danced around a great cylindrical drum they burned incense laid down with on a raw or of raw meat on it and struck it with several heralds with several heads. When the feast was over, the tribal chief sat on the drum and was given the new title Great Sun, Tiger or some similar name. Perhaps these titles have some connection with the sun which appears on prehistoric bronze drums or with or with the tiger head pictured on modern Japanese drums. Tong tong. In la in later times, wooden images of people, birds and lizards were lined on the drum. The significance of this is no longer known, but an old man said he supposed they were meant to guard the dam. As for the dog and the crocodile, the Bada tribe of the Simbiring relates that their tribal father was once saved by a dog. Members of the Marga Tumpul, of ma members of the Marga Tumpul are not allowed to eat dog meat. The Menangkaba tribe Luhak, 13 Kota, descendants. The descends from a dog. The Bukit Besar near Ayerpuak is supposed to be a woman mating with a dog. The spirit of a dog seems formerly to have been the mighty warrior Pangulu Balang. A great dog Tom, built of heavy blocks of sandstone, is on the right bank of Bagumun, Bar of the Bagumun, sort of Unterudang, while a smaller one lies south of Gunung Tua. In Simralungun are found ones with the bones of the dogs. The figures, the figure of a dog is also carved on the Batak magician's one. The close relation between human beings and crocodiles is known throughout Sumatra. And Nias crocodiles was formerly the emblem of the Matthias tribal chiefs. We will now let we will now let the stone images rest for a moment. In connection with what we have been elsewhere in Sumatra and Nias, we may say with considerable certainty that face of merit were given at the time where they were founded. Soon, we shall find entirely expected corroboration of this fact. Now, a few brief remarks regarding the a, new, a few brief remarks new regarding the bronze culture. They must prove that the founders were already acquainted with bronze. They made drums, helmets, swords, neckbands, armlets, and ankles, etc. In Basema, indeed, bronze, type, bronze rings with spiral have been found, also pendants and earrings with a human face, a ball with an animal face, etc. In Korinchi, was found a face with spiral ornaments, a calf, and a fragment of a drum. A meager harvest, to be sure. The discover the discovery of a bronze spear points spear point near one near one of the canon ship stones in Jambi proves that the builders of these monuments also knew bronze. The megalith builders of Central Sumatra may also have used bronze tools for making their pillars, but alas, we have no tangi tangible evidence of this fact. And the Bataks, their wonderful objects of brass, were probably inspired by some prehistoric bronze art. During my wanderings, I saw some bronze objects which differed very much from the decorative art of the present time. It is simply unthinkable that Batak megalith builders were not acquainted with bronze, and it may be that, at some future, at some future time, prehistoric objects in this metal will be brought to the light. It cannot be proved that Nias also knew bronze during the Neolithic period, but it is quite probable. Not long ago, artistic bronze lamps were cast with figures of a dog, a dragon, a hornbill, etc. In the Lampongs, 
there, uh, there is a peculiar custom which allows the thieves to buy a title and a pepadon for money. A pepadon is a wooden sheet with the head of a bird, a dragon, an eleven or a horse. For merely payment was made in buffaloes, rice, rice, etc. The possession of a pepadon confers all sorts of privileges. One is allowed to wear certain jewels, to be carried in a sedan chair with a figure of an animal's head, to erect a gate in front of the house, to demand a certain dory for one's daughter, etc. There are a great number of pepadons, the, more one, the one more important than the other. It is even possible to, to be promoted from one pepadon to another, while in every district, these seats and the privileges attached to them are, are different. Now, it is not my intention to give a lengthy review of the pepadon system. I simply wish to call attention to a few particulars. Formerly, a pepadon might only be erected after a man after 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 a man had cut off four heads. These heads were struck against the joints and later kept in the chest under the seat. The chops of the wooden animal's head were smeared with blood. In Koi, the seat was called Kosi Bulampok. It was placed on a great stone around which was hung a drapery with the picture of a sheep. The tribal chief and his wife were brought to the festal grounds in a wooden ship on, on wheels. The pro had an animal head, usually that of rhinoceros bird, an elephant of a buffalo. In the middle of the ship was a baldachin, on which was placed a rhinoceros bird of a serpent made of cloth, to right and left were poles decorated like trees on the branches hung heads. On the branches hung beds, cells, little pots, pieces of cloth, coins, delicacies, etc. The number of objects depended on the rank of the owner. The articles which hung on the tree were later pulled out, pulled off by the young volk, by the young folks. Formerly, the dead bodies of tribal chiefs in full regalia were set down in these wagons. Around them were placed wooden doors and animals made of cloth. The trees were also replaced by long posts with feathers and crowned with birds. Rice was scattered in the ship, after which it was hauled into a deep ravin. Living people thus had the right to be carried in a prow andak or prow garuda. In some districts, the woman was allowed to rest her feet on a slave who was killed after arrival at the festive grounds. Beside the ship workmen who dragged over the ground brass plates tied with long strings of cotton cloth. In front of the position work for women holding a great bender in the form of crescent and moon with the, with the picture of a ship. The dancing girls were allowed to wear twelve brass Bracelets on each arm, and on their heads were wore a broad shaped metal crown. Across the road was stretched a rope which was severed by two marks clones. One was a man and had to walk as he was as he were lame. The other was a woman, usually the chief's sister in law. When the rope was cut, they had to pay certain sum of money or to give some rice. Also, they had to summon to being beaten by the guardian of the rope. In some districts, he gave them a slight prick with a knife, upon which they were supposed to give a loud yell. The tax of these clowns, indeed, was to make trouble continuously. Now and then, they even hindered the progress of the ship, pulling, in, uh, pulling it alternately from one to the other. Clumsy jokes were the old of the day, and they were allowed to say anything that happened to come into their heads. They swore that, they swore that black was white, 
and that that high was low, that great was more. They also turned us upside down everything on which they could lay their hands on the Cossack or Sack, their actions, the better the festival. In the procession was also carried a cake in the form of a crocodile or a rhinoceros, but around it lay numerous coins. This money was later divided among the family and the cake was cut into pieces of which everyone received a certain portion. The most precious bit was the lower jaw, which was given to the tribal chief. The eating of this cake was supposed to encourage the god of the crops. The owner of a pepperdon was also allowed to have a bag to his chair. From this also, a human head or a buffalo's head was necessary. This bag was decorated with figures of birds and rosettes in rare specimens a great penis was carved. The back of the chair was therefore intended to represent a human being. European writers have always declared that the Pepadon system original in Bantam Jawa. It is surprising how, how long this mistaken notion had, has been maintained, since it is quite plain that all these ceremonies have the character of the megalith face promotion in rank, face of merit, great extravagance, titles, privileges, head hunting, and finally the erection of a memorial, and along with these ceremonies appears also what ethnology called the potlach. Now, there is a very little difference between the feast of merit and the potlach. The megalith feast in Nias and in lesser degree those in the battlelands bear a staring resemblance to the potlach. The Japanese element in the Lampong in the Lampong feast of rank is there is therefore poorly circumstantial and appears only in the few irrelevant details. The owner of a pepper don may allow his wife to dance on a brazen silver, reminiscent of the ground dancing stones of Nias. And what is Pepadon Sep and Osausa? The Pepadon or the Pepadon owner may also erect a gate in front of his house. On top of this gate is the figure of a bird, exactly as is in the Japanese story. To, to right and left are the figures of serpents, sometimes had, and in rare cases, every even one beings formerly. There were also guests ground by the figure of a serpent or of a sheep. Permission to erect them was only given after the successful, after the successful termination of a headhunting expedition. I have never heard, however, that skulls were hung upon it. This was always stubbornly denied. However, a slave, a slave had to be buried under the gate. Though the ceremony was often omitted, people walked, people walked to the gate in the times, in times of sickness, failures of the crops, failures of the crops, miscarriage on war. A peculiar privilege was their permission to enlarge the ancestors' graves. For this ceremony, a certain number of buffaloes had to be slaughtered and a number of heads severed. Every time the rest was enlarged, a certain title was conferred and a high rank, and a higher rank, aside in the next world. Here is the most primitive form of the religious custom, also by more cultured races, Hindus, Egyptians, of enlarging their shrines and so acquiring magic power. In Lampung and Kroi are also found weapons with pictures of ships, figures of people, animals, trees, etc. Recently, Dr. A. Steinmann had devoted considerable study to this subject. The writer sees in this portrayals the death, the death ship with the with the world, with the world tree and various other cosmic symbols. We merely make this assertion and try to justice it by various facts. In minor details, some difference of opinion may be possible 
but one interpretation need not exclude the other. And so we believe that there is a close relation between these wavings and the Papadon system. And the Papadon system. Not only are these clothes draped around the stone when the Papadon is mounted and carried at the head of the procession, but the foremost attribute of the fish, the wagon, is in the form of a sheep. It is really an enlarged copy of the Papadon itself and is sometimes called brow Papadon. There is no doubt that these ships, the ships on some of these cuts, represent Papadons. They either contain a Papadon or represent a sin from Papadon fish. We see people sitting on elephants and naturally think at once of the eleven Papadon. That we are concerned here, here that we are concerned here not with a Japanese custom, but with a ceremony which has given observed for the th for thousands of years of years is evidenced by the prehistoric element image image with the human figures from Pasema. But at the same time we have here evidence that the image of Pasema related to the fish of rank and that that we were erected as a memorial to the Peparon ceremony. No doubt that it, no doubt they were dedicated with a great deal of ritual. Around them were set up the poles with birds as in Timor and at the present time. The mythical trees were with birds, dead bo the dead balls, etc. All this to create the illusion of the mystic boat. And this boat must originally have been the place of initiation where the candidates set up, set under the tree of knowledge, where they were introduced to the mystical totem animal monster of, initi of the initiation and they and where they beheld the ritual contest between the two varieties symbolized by quarrelsome clones. The final climax of this initiation was the ship, symbol of the waxing and warning moon of life and death, light and dark, good and evil. In later times it was regarded principally as the dead ship on which the tribal chief journeyed to the spirit world with, the, with all the attributes of his power, the pardons, trees, animals, images of the dead, images of the dead, etc. Representations of this kind are also found on mats and in bedrock patterns. In lampong brass walls are made in the form of a ship for siri for, and for blackening the teeth. On the fore side is the head of a bird a deer or a buffalo. Apparently, these objects were inspired by mothers from the Bronze Age, but in this case, the ship form has no deeper significance.